everyone, and welcome to Own Your Voice. Today, I have a very special guest with me. Jermaine Smith is a St. Louis-based singer who has found success in the world of opera. He has actually traveled internationally to, I believe, 13 different countries, playing several lead roles in Porgy and Bess. And just recently, this year, he got his first ever contract with the Metropolitan Opera. So thank you so much for agreeing to sit down with me and have this conversation and just celebrate a little of the success that you've a lot of the success that you've had in the music world and share your wisdom with all of my listeners. So thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to you and have you explain a little bit more about yourself. Um, well, what do you want to know? I want to know because all the fun facts. Talking, you know, it'll be 30 minutes later before I stop. That's okay. I want to know how you got your start in music because I did, I did my research and I know that at first you were not about the opera life. Not at, I wasn't about, I, I wasn't even about the singing life. Okay, okay. Uh, my first uh, got started, uh, I was a drummer. Music was introduced to me in middle school. Drummer, and I played in marching band to jazz bands, concert band. And then from there, I went to high school, uh, St. Louis Public School High School graduate. At Roosevelt High School at the time, Delo Thetford was the music director. And I was playing drums for his vocal jazz ensemble. And he heard me making fun of an opera singer when we were coming from a performance. And understand my knowledge of, of opera was little to none, where I was just in the back of the bus going, I want some pizza with mozzarella. I want some pizza with mozzarella. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Jack? Okay, Jack, sorry. That's not, my, is that what happened uh, at the time, too? And that's how you knew you were destined yes, to stop? Yes, since I have a rock waller, um, Jack. He, anytime I sing, he starts to sing with me. Awesome. So that's what, that's what, that's been my quarantine um, <laughs> duet every day. Love it. Lovely. Think, so, um, I was, he turned to say, you have the potential to be an opera singer. And I just laughed in his face. Like, I don't even sing in your choir, let alone, um, right. an opera singer. And he said, if I found a, a program, I'm going to put you in it. Opera Theater St. Louis started the artist and training program. Um, that was like my last year of high school. And. He said, I got this program, what you to do? I said, I'm not doing your program, man. He said, you're going to do the program. I said, I'm not going to do the program. He said, you're going to do the program. I said, I'm not doing the program. He said, your grade depends upon it. I said, when does this program start? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I didn't play with my grades. I was the a teacher power. <laughs> yes. Well, for me, he knew how serious I was about my grades. Yeah. So um, he used that against me. And, and I did it. I did the program. But I thought it was fun. I did it for fun. Listen, I love to make people, now one thing I do love to do is make people laugh. And I love, and I have not an embarrassing bone in my body, so it didn't matter to me. So I said, I'm going to go up, I'll do your program. Got up there, singing my little opera. <laughs> and then I, um, I won, believe it or not. I, wow. I, I didn't believe it. I was the winner. Um, I remember when they was announcing it, it was like, you know, first, play, it was like honorable mention. It was like, uh, I, said, I was like, come on, fourth place. Yeah. And so, come on, third. A high you know. achiever, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, because, you know, think about it. Not being a singer, I was like, I've spent all this time. I wanted to be for something. And you got to understand, I, I grew up in the inner city, uh, inner city, in the hood. My mom, I, I'm the first to graduate from college in my family. So, you know, listen, there was no opera singing going around, going, going, going on around where I was living. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And whenever I tried to practice, even my mom was like, that's enough practicing. You know, I'm like, Why do the day? that's enough singing. I had to go out my back door on a vacant lot. Why? Trying to sing and practice. And even neighbors was calling my parents like, what's wrong with your son? Making these crazy sounds. That's so awesome. Back, back to um, when they called out uh, first place to Jermaine Smith. And I was just sitting there, and the girl nudged me. That's you, stupid. No. <laughs> I jumped up, and I was, I was walking up there. You know, like, I felt like it was a beauty page. I was like, <laughs> you know, and everybody was clapping. I looked out. My mom was standing up clapping. I was yes. like, you wouldn't even really practice, mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> so from there, um, I got the scholarship. I didn't want to um, lose the scholarship at the same time. My, my field of interest was computer science, mathematics. So I just won also a competition in, in, math, in computers mm -hmm. where I, I designed a, 
um, uh, a volcano. It, you know, I, I, I took, I took uh, algebraic equa equations mm -hmm. and you can put in just like a calculator since you don't have to worry about, you know, doing all the calculations. And you just give the integers, it'll do the equation. Then when it finishes, it draw a whole volcano, it erupt and had little people running at the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> and so I won that, I won a scholarship in that as well. So oh. I was set to go to an engineering school, but then I could not get the scholarship if I did not go to a school that had a reputable musical pro program. Okay. So I went, I was gonna to go to Rolla, University mm -hmm. of Missouri Rolla. But then I moved, moved to University of Missouri St. Louis. And that's where I met Dr. Mark Madsen, yes. who we also have a connection with. Oh, and fabulous. I remember calling him on his phone and saying, hey, I need to sing for your music thingy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, was like, he was like, okay, uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, why don't you just come by my house? And I sang for him. And then he got on the phone. I was like, wow, was, that, was it that bad? Yeah. And then he, said, he said, no, 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 I'm trying to get scholarship money for you. And, he, and from there, thank to doc, thank, thanks to Dr. Uh, Dr. Madsen. Mm -hmm. doc, I mean, Delo Thetford discovered me. Dr. Madsen encouraged me because I kept telling him, listen, I'm going to be honest with you. You don't have to waste any time with me. Go ahead and work with the other students. I just need to come over here. You know, we was, you know, seeing a little bit, but my studies and interest is over on the other side of campus in computer mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, well, well, let's just go ahead and keep working, just uh -huh. seeing some things. And I did. And in singing with him, I kept winning competitions. And then I got a call on my phone asking, for me to come to New York to audition for Corgi and Bess. Now, mind you, I had not, my only experience was through the opera program. Yeah. The next year, I asked for renewal my scholarship with Opera Theatre St. Louis. They told me to come in and, you know, sing during their audition period. So I did. Then they gave me a call back saying that great news, we're going to give you a renewal and they want you to sing in the opera. I said, sing in the opera? <laughs> wow. You know, I was like 18. And I was like, ooh, ooh. Okay, it's one thing to joke around in high school and mm -hmm. I'm gonna be around people who do this for a living. I got really concerned and nervous. Mm -hmm. So I did it. I remember going to rehearsal and I, I, I was sitting in rehearsal and I was just trying to fake it. You know, you know how you fake it till you make it. I was sitting there like, oh, and I was so nervous. And they stopped and said, we're gonna introduce you. Just, could you go around the room and just say, um, say your name and where you're studying? People were sending up, hello, my name is Don McGillicuddy. <laughs> and I'm doing my master's at the Juilliard School of Music. <laughs> Hello, my name is Matt Duncan. And I'm um, doing my um, master's at um, uh, Manhattan School of Music. Hello, my name is Tim Schmidt. <laughs> and I, I'm doing my artist diploma at um, Curtis Institute of Music. And they got to me. I said, stood up. Jermaine Smith, computer science, mathematics major, sophomore. <laughs> 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 and so everybody looked and said, like, what the, uh -huh. <laughs> what, what, what is this going on? <laughs> it's like when you show up for the wrong class on the first day of oh, school. Oh my goodness, like, did you come in the wrong building? And so, you know, it, not only was I said that, I was the only, I was the only African American, I was the only black man in there. So it really looked crazy, like what's going on here? And so um, then the, the, um, the chorus master explained to them that I was a uh, winner of their Young Artist, uh, well, the Artist in Training Program, and Colin Graham, may he rest in peace, another person who encouraged my career, um, encouraged that I do, uh, being part of the chorus of Billy Budd. Look at that, my first opera, Billy Budd, uh -huh. of all <laughs> operas to be. Right. I was like, this stuff is for the birds. I mean, it's that difficult music. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the music was this thick. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. used to seeing a little page of music. Yep. So I did it and um, I enjoyed it. It was like summer camp to me. Yeah. And each year I did another opera. Next year they asked me to another, then next year another, then next year another. And that happened from um, 93, 94, 95. And then in 96, uh, that's when I got that call, asking me to come to New York to audition for this Corgi and Bess with, by Houston Grand Opera. I thought it was a fake call. I'm not used to stuff like that. Right. So I ignored it. It was like a week later, I led Dr. Mass. I say, hey, is this call real? Listen to this. I've, yeah, that's back when they had answering mm -hmm. machines. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I, oh, they click a button. And he, listened, <laughs> and he said, this is real. I thought, oh, it is. I said, oops. 
<laughs> and, and since I waited so long, I think I waited like a month. I, I oh waited my so gosh. long. It was time. It was, I had to go there by the end of the week. Oh, the audition. No. So I had to learn something really quick. So I, I learned, I got plenty of nothing. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. I learned that within like two or three days, really fast. And I scrambled, I asked mentors and I asked friends to build up money to get a, uh, a plane ticket. Dr. Masson helped support me as well. Mm -hmm. Got a ticket, I flew up there. Since I knew people from Opera Theater St. Louis, I made plenty of friends in those four years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the guy's name was Sam Mungo. He was like, um, and Nathan Gunn, who's been at the Met several times. And they was like, oh yeah, come on up. You can stay with me, Jermaine. So I went there, flew there, went to their house, stayed there, sang at the audition, came back, and I got a call saying, we want you to come and join our tour. Wow. Singing Porgy and Bess. Now, mind you, I just learned the one song I got plenty of nuts in, in mm -hmm. a couple of days. Then they sent me the music of Porgy and Bess. I thought Billy Budd was thick mm -hmm. and long. Oh my goodness. That score is like that thick. Mm -hmm. And so it was, you got to understand, for me, it was mind-blowing not coming from a musical background, yeah. you know, seeing music and thinking that a person can actually memorize all of this mm -hmm. in one setting. Mm -hmm. And so I had to learn Porgy and Bess, believe it or not, in over a weekend. I, I was cramming it. They, when I got, they flew me in on a Wednesday. I had, I had a coaching 10, 10 to 1, 2 to 5, 7 to 10. Oh. I had that with a pianist on... Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And then on Sunday, the assistant director ran me through the entire show, saying, you're going to be doing so-and-so's part. You're going to make up this part. Oh, this person's not coming back. You're going to do his part. So I'm mm -hmm. writing down this stuff. And then on Monday, this big cast of 50 people come in. And then that's it. And then we rehearsed it for that week. And then we fly to Paris, Opera Bastille. And I'm in Paris and doing this show. And every time I come off stage, I have my little cheat sheet trying to see what was up next. I had uh, <laughs> lyrics yes. in the other pocket. Yeah, and I made it through. And while I was there, a guy named Larry Marshall, who was one of the prominent sporting lives um, of that time, he, he was part of that Glyndebourne tour of the resurrection of the Porgy and Best with John Domain, with Houston Grand Opera and all of them. He came up to me and said, man, I really like that you are so professional. You have your stuff together. You're always in your point. He didn't know that I had no other choice. Right. I didn't have anything else to do but to try to make sure I had all my stuff together. Mm -hmm. He said, I want to invite you to another, another touring company that I work with, which is um, New York Harlem Productions. Mm -hmm. And he said, you won't make as much money, but you get a lot of more opportunity for some other roles. Mm -hmm. I said, sure. So my, my doing and performance there offered me another opportunity. So I say to singers, performers, know that your performance does not necessarily begin when you're on stage your performance begins when you leave your home mm -hmm. that's when your performance begins because he watched what i did mm -hmm. he watched how i behaved uh how i had my music mm -hmm. i was not late in rehearsals how i was on time he watched those things and that got me another opportunity so your performances begin when you leave your home mm -hmm. not necessarily when you hit the stage right uh, and then and from there that's when it took off i i got there the next thing you know i was singing undertaker I was singing Jim, then Jake, and all of those roles until I got to Sporting Life. And once I hit Sporting Life, that's the one everybody just loved. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know that that just took off, and I just started doing Sporting Life. I covered him actually in Sporting Life, and after covering him, I had an opportunity where uh, Washington National Opera was doing it for their 50th anniversary. And okay, Jack. Uh, <laughs> This Jack. You I want to meet Jack. Yes. Hello. He's such a good boy. Jack. Hello, Jack. <laughs> Hello. So you sing me some opera. Let's go. <laughs> okay, oh, that's enough. I love that. That's awesome. <laughs> okay, Jack. Go sit down. <laughs> oh, go ahead. <laughs> so he's not camera shy at all. Oh my goodness. Uh uh. So um there you have it. And then from there. That's where I took off, and I I did uh, I was hired by Houston um, by Washington National Opera to do their Sport Life. There was double casting, brand new production by Francesca Zambello, who's now actually she's the artistic director over Washington, I believe now, as well as Glimmerglass, and she's over the, both of those companies. But but the, at that time, 
the new your new hot director in town and she did a new production and i was a part of that production mm-hmm. and from there she double casted but she said i love you i want you to be single cast can you do all the performances i said yes i can do all the performances wow. <laughs> because if you're going to pay me yes i can. And <laughs> right. so, listen um and through that contract i got an agent and so it just kept going from there yeah. And once I did that, I did Houston, I did um, Washington National Opera. Then I did LA Opera. That's where I met. Okay. I think you might have gotten muted. Let me see. Call coming in. Stop uh-huh. Okay. Are we back? Are we good? We are back. We are live. Yep. <laughs> okay. Um, the Placido Domingo story. Would you like to hear that story? So, of course. I'm here in the rest. I'm in rehearsal, and I go we have a rehearsal break. Go to the restroom. I'm in the restroom. I'm in the stall, and someone else in the stall next to me. I'm like, man. <laughs> All right, they really speaking some stuff on that phone over there. Mm-hmm. And so I come out and wash my hands. Next thing you know, here Placido Don Domingo, like I, he's one of my favorite singers and performers, is, and he walks out. I'm like, <laughs> he's like, yeah, hello, I'm and he just walked, walked past me, and we, and I went back to the rehearsal room, and uh, we went back to rehearsal, and we started doing the scene, and I, he was sitting out there watching, and then we took another break, and then he comes up to me, hey, why didn't you say something when I said you in the bathroom? <laughs> I was like, oh. I said, Maestro, how can I just, I right. didn't want to, I was in the bathroom. Right. <laughs> so, he said, like, you are great. So when I, when he watched the performance, when we did that performance with, um, um, th- at that time, he, he, he was over LA Opera. Mm-hmm. So he was there in Houston. I mean, he was there in Washington watching as well. And it's, this is actually on, online with Opera News, if you look up the production, they recorded it and they had a live broadcast. And in between the shows, they interviewed him and he said something that was phenomenal. He said, they interviewed him, he said, he talked about a lot of things and they ended, said, before we go back into our second half, well, Maestro, we know that you have over 128 rows under your belt. Tell us, do you think sporting life would ever, would ever be a role for you? He said, ha, 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 no, 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 no. This role here, this is something you have to be born with, things you have to be born with. And unfortunately, I don't have these things. But when you have a Jermaine Smith, you don't need any other sports in life. This is, this is, the, this is something you, you're just born with. You, you, you have a man like this, you don't need anything. So he said, when you have a Jermaine Smith, you don't need anything. I, mm-hmm. I, That's that, amazing. I, I paraphrase a little bit, but he did say my name. He <laughs> says. He did say something about when you have a Jermaine Smith. I can't remember exactly, but he was like, when you have a Jermaine Smith, you don't need anything else. And the, to prove the point that he, I was his, one of his, or he can say that he loves my sporting life. Mm-hmm. They had another good friend of mine who does sporting life as well, and he performed for him about a couple of, about a year or so later. And he said, he went to meet him. He said, Maestro, it's a pleasure to meet you, finally. He said, and the first thing he said to him was, Hello, um, do you know Jermaine Smith? <laughs> he said, yes. Have you seen him do this role? He is phenomenal. He said, thank you. <laughs> you have a great performance too. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> with something like that. Um, but yeah, that, that was my experience with um, Maestro Placido Domingo. But from there, like I said, I went on and I performed it at Washington National Opera, the same production. I performed it at LA Opera, then I performed it at Chicago Lyric, mm-hmm. then it went back to Washington, then it went back to Chicago Lyric, then it went to um, a Seattle Opera. I done, I done it twice there as well. I have actually done Sporting Life, literally. Literally, not figuratively, literally, probably about a thousand times. And I've done it, like I said, like you said earlier, over 13 different countries. Mm-hmm. And I've done over well, I guess you could say 14 productions now that I've got them, the Met production under my belt, 14 different productions. And I promise you, every time I do this role, 
I make it as if it's my first time. Because yeah. I love, I love the opera. Mm -hmm. That is one of my favorite operas. Favorite operas to do. My other favorite opera is Tosca. Okay. I love the opera. Mm -hmm. I used to actually in college blast that. You know, people are going down the street blasting hip hop music, watching their car. I used to go down the street blasting Tosca. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, I love it. <laughs> I'll take some confidence right there. So <laughs> I'm watching my car. Like, yeah, yeah. Sing that stuff. <laughs> right, right. And one of my favorite recordings is uh Placido Domingo, Leontine Price, Cheryl Mills. And I'm just loving all of that. Mm -hmm. You know. Well, it's kind of a you know, I love it all. I'm blasting it. Yes. So, um, yes, and actually up to the present of all the productions I've done. I mean, I've had a chance to do it it's, um, in Japan, mm -hmm. my uh, Sydney, the Sydney Opera House Ooh, there yes. as well. Gorgeous. I had a chance possibly do it at La Scala, but at the time I was at Sydney Opera House and it was not, they overlapped and mm -hmm. I... I couldn't give up Sydney because I was I had already accepted a contract. Yeah. And so, who, who knows? It may come again. But I really right. enjoyed the production in um, Sydney mm -hmm. as well. And actually, a year ago, I actually directed my first board game best. Did you really? <gasps> See, oh, you didn't know that. I did not know that. Do tell. Spill the tea. <laughs> little nugget for you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> So yes, um, that was an, that was a great experience. I was really concerned, that, like, oh man, can I actually do this? You know, do mm -hmm. I know it? And um, a good friend of mine who was doing Porgy, Neil Nelson, phenomenal um, bass baritone. He's performed here in St. Louis multiple times with Opera Theater St. Louis, with Winter Opera, with um, um, what is the opera company with Scott Schoonover? Uh, Union Avenue. Union Avenue Opera. Yeah, he's done a lot of those roles um, there. He actually had a chance to do um, Scorpia, the Ooh. Tosca, you know, and I loved it. Yes. And, um, so um, he, he recommended me, mm -hmm. and then they, uh, they needed Sport Life. So I actually, I was the director and I was Sport Life. I was going to ask you, because, you know, if you have a Jermaine Smith, you don't need anything else, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh, I'll see how it goes. <laughs> so I... I I, and then that was something I had another director working with me because they was concerned about me being able to do both. And I told mm -hmm. them I could, but they brought in another director to work as well. And it ended up being the same. He worked, he went to work with Porgy and Bess. I did all of the other thing. He went and worked with the other Porgy and Bess duets, the Porgy and Bess duets, the Crown and Bess duets. And then I did, I did all the rest. Wow. Wow. And, um, and it turned out that, um, the, the director, it was her first time doing it. So she was still learning the music. She, she didn't quite know it. So when I, I first sing them, she was like, I, am, I need you to um, help me out here. Mm -hmm. I said, sure, a maestra, maestra. And, um, and I said, sure. And so I sat next to her, the pianist, and she was like, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm still working with these tempos. Could you? So I end up having to get up and conduct the pork invest in reverse. No pressure, no pressure. Yeah, you, know, you see what I'm saying? But one thing, I, I tell you one thing about me is that if something needs to be done, if you ask me, I'm going to go for it. I, I see it as math. I just saw the problem. And so here I am conducting the actual pork invest. And I was trying to look at the score and she was like, oh, this is great. And she saw writing in the score. So I, so I had to conduct it from memory. Wow. And, and that, it showed me how much I really know the piece. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. I and the pianist, he was a retired Metropolitan Opera pianist, and he said, "My goodness, it's phenomenal that you're doing a phenomenal job. I'm so thank I'm so thankful you're here." Yeah. And so I did. I conducted it in rehearsal, and then the chorus master asked if I would come in the chorus and talk about a lot of the what. Um, the nuances of the piece. And mm -hmm. so now I'm doing, now I'm working with the chorus. Now I'm working with the chorus master. And he's like, I can sit up and you all the day because you are doing the phenomenal job. Oh, that's amazing. And so after I worked with them and then the choreographer had to leave. So I had to do choreography 
for the show. Yes, yes, believe it or not. If I pull up the program, you'll see Jermaine Steele, Sporting Life, co director slash choreographer slash <laughs> chorus slash. Um, really, the, you played every single role. It was just a one man show. Listen. <laughs> and the fight scene, they didn't have a fight coordinator. So I had, I had to do it. I, yes. No, yeah, no. I kid you not. Pull up the program and you'll see my name. You'll see <laughs> all those lists up under my name. I'm gonna like include yes. it here and then I'll circle your name in it so that everybody can see it. Okay, I got you, I got you. <laughs> yes. so, so yeah, I directed it and it went so well. And I'll send you some pictures of the production because what was yes. great about this production, it was I was working with a symphony mm -hmm. and I, it was supposed to be semi-staged, mm -hmm. but using video mapping, that's when it looks like it's moving mm -hmm. or stuff like that. Listen, when I show you these pictures, the scene, working with this guy, he was so, it was so incredible. Mm -hmm. You're going you're gonna to think that it's changing. You're going to think, even though it's on stage, when you see these pictures, they're, they're, they are amazing. Maybe you can um, pop them up when you're, um, as you. I got the magic. I can do that. Yes. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're phenomenal. They're beautiful. So, so now it's a possibility. I don't want to. Talk too soon, but it, I may be directing it again in some places. Okay. You know, after maybe just directing this time. Y who knows? It's, it, listen, if they want me to do more, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's a possibility that it may be with. I just been not saying anything. I, I, I just okay. That's okay. That's okay. I'm dying to know, but it's fine. <laughs> you know, you know, it may be down under. I just want to say that it may be down under. Again. Okay. I don't okay. Know. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. That, we'll those, keep it are on the talks, <laughs> those, those are talks those are talks that, that that started when i was at the metropolitan opera you can probably make the links together after talking you know to some people who are connected to you know mm -hmm. i down under country mm -hmm. um continent uh, well, well, nothing nothing uh, but but but, but yeah, um mm -hmm, that's fine mm -hmm. <laughs> i won't draw it don't worry it's good well we see what we'll see what happens but it, it all stopped with um, with the COVID nineteen. Okay, yeah. Um, and so hopefully, when things settle down, we find our new normal. Yeah. We'll get into mm -hmm. um, maybe those talks will start again. And I did see something that you had said in another article I read online about COVID nineteen showing you the truth about yes. um, your. I guess, role where your job, where your current situation is in life and how you know some people that are walking away from the arts because they realize during this downtime that they don't want to go back to the craziness of that life. But for yes. you, you found that you thrived in that and that you're missing that. So explain a little bit about how COVID-19 has been for you. Yes, you just said it. I said COVID-19, I believe, has truly brought out truth. Mm -hmm. I think that's for everybody across the board in your own field and within your own self mm -hmm. because you have now no one to give you that gratification that you need you don't have an audience you don't have you, you we didn't we have no friends no physical contact mm -hmm. so you had to find yourself to you had to find center and peace within yourself mm -hmm. with that being said you know think about the number of friends of mine that told me that they went back home they hadn't been home in years some Mm -hmm. went to be with their mom so some had been on the road so much that some lived on the road mm -hmm. they were performing so much so they didn't have a place to go but home at times and and some have said like you said like i said in uh, in the article that they not being a part of that fast life and auditioning and stress and all of that they actually have enjoyed the peace and they, they have honestly have said they are not going to go back. Yeah. They said they're comfortable. Now, on the flip side, I said to myself, I was someone who always, I always believed that I, I try my best to work hard to be up to par with everybody else. Mm -hmm. I always walk in the room thinking I'm not the, the best singer. I'm not the top, you know, here I am. I'm the computer science, mm -hmm. mathematics guy amongst people who have been doing this all their lives. And, you know, that's I have that. I still have some of those high school, or those early years, um, uh, you know, ideals within me. Sure. But I say so. I 
I performed because the opportunity was there because I was asked. Mm -hmm. And then another thing I like to do is teach. I've taught, I whenever I'm not performing, I always register as a substitute teacher so I can go into the inner city public schools mm -hmm. and be not only a teacher, but also try to be a black positive role model because there's not a lot of black male teachers. Mm -hmm. not, it's not a lot of male teachers in the school system, let alone black male teachers. And just to be there in a the presence, you know, and I always, if the, if the, if the teacher had, had not left any assignments, I create one mm -hmm. and then I always ask them, can you all guess what I do? And then somebody, yeah, you're a teacher. I said, no, yeah, but that's not what I do for a living. And then, you know, someone they keep guessing. Someone say, you're a singer. Yes. They said, what, what, what kind of music? Of course they say reggae because they see all my dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. And I said, like, no, mm -hmm. the gospel, jazz. I said, no. Then somebody would say, I know, you sing Oprah. I said, I sing Oprah. <laughs> no, <not> Oprah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> then somebody else said, you mean opera. I said, they said, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And then, um, because I've been, I've been doing this so, so for so long, mm -hmm. here I am in a high school, someone says, yes, I know he sings um, opera. Because when I was in grade school, now mind you, I'm in high school. Mm -hmm. Since I was in grade school, he, he, was a, he was a substitute teacher in my room, and he sang for us. I said, wow, you remember that. So I always try to find an avenue to sing for them because mm -hmm. I feel like if I broaden their horizons, even if they don't like the music, mm -hmm. once they hear it, they can't take away the experience. Right. And so and, and the point is proven with that young, that young lady was saying that she remembered me. Mm -hmm. So that's another side that I do. And I've learned in this COVID-19 that I truly enjoy teaching and I truly enjoy performing because not having it mm -hmm. at your disposal mm -hmm. truly helped me understand a truth mm -hmm. that I may, I may have grew up thinking that this is something that fell in my lap or someone made me do, but no, I've discovered that, that this is something that's not made me do. This is something that's a part of who I am and what I do. Yeah. And it's to the point where I feel a I feel a piece of me not being mm -hmm. serviced or massaged or fed that is starving right now. Mm -hmm. And that's how I know that this is something that I love to do. Because I gotta be honest, even when I'm teaching in school, I'm always working with kids. If if I end up being in a math class or sometimes I get into a music class, some um, principals ask me to stay as a permanent sub and I'll always create a performance um, club or something like that. And we'll I'll put on a production. That's so awesome. I'm always performing in some sort, you know, some manner. Mm -hmm. And I do not know how anybody who's a person who stays at home and does nothing mm -hmm. survive. I, I just can't do it. So I've, my performance lately in my COVID-19 has been every day. I get up my routine is yoga. I do my yoga. Um, I have learned a whole new yoga. I can okay. do, I can, I can teach uh, Ashtanga yoga now. I've watched the video so much that I don't even look at the video anymore. I do the whole series. That's awesome. And, and um, I sing in the shower. That's when Jack and I do our duets together. Yes. Uh -huh. uh, I want, and I sing, believe it or not, I have sang Sport and Life so much mm -hmm. that that I warm up with it. I sing, I warm up, and I sing through the whole row. Mm -hmm. And then I think sing through some new rows, some other rows. This is my shower. My shower is probably about an hour. Holy cow. A little over an hour long because <laughs> I'm singing in there. So you have no skin left by the time you come out of the shower. You know, <laughs> shit, exactly. I come out all pruned up. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good look right there, let me tell you. <laughs> and um, so, yeah, and then... And then I'll find something else to do. I do a project around the house. I've, I've repainted the deck. I've gone through my entire closet. I've given over a third of my clothes away. I said, if I've not worn you within a year, you're getting donated. Mm -hmm. So I've done that. I gave away two bags of shoes. Oh. I've, um, I've given away suits, ties. I was giving away things that had tags on them. Doesn't matter. I put together a shed with my brother down. Now I'm, I'm redoing the basement. I've gotten up to my property. I've repainted walls, redid floors. I've become a, nice. I've become a lawn doctor. I, I have, I have our lawn looking so well. I have a get that green that thumb. I yes, I have a mixture that I do. And I, I promise you, I put, it's like a half a cup of pneumonia, half a cup of dishwashing liquid, half a cup of scope, a uh, mouthwash, 
half a cup of no in a can of soda and a can of beer you mix it into a sprayer and my grass is green thick i have all the neighbors around me asking about my grass they was out there talking about it so now the lady across the street is using my mixture the one next door want to use it yes how did you stumble on that when you in quarantine you have nothing to do <laughs> i promise you <laughs> YouTube is a dangerous place. Oh let me tell you. <laughs> you. <laughs> but now that I know that you're a quarantine, you know, so close to me, I might have you come out and look at my lawn. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I can get it together. I kid mm -hmm. you not. So uh, now the other thing I'm doing is refinish my basement. It's like, like I said, I just have to keep it moving. Yeah. Um, so I'm not, I just can't be a body that stays and lays yeah and not do anything uh it just it, it just i i since i missed that i and when i say i miss performing it's not so much that i'm saying i'm missing getting on stage and the applause and all of that i'm not right. talking about that kind of performance i actually missed the entire process mm -hmm. i missed the travel i missed the arriving i missed the re, uh, meeting up with new making new friends and meeting up with old colleagues mm -hmm. i missed the rehearsal period i missed the goals of reaching yeah reaching and reaching and then to the point we have the entire opera together to the first performance opening nights that energy of opening night i missed that i missed the last night and at the end of the completion that we start and then there's the end of one chapter and the start of a new mm -hmm. i'm missing all those things and particularly around the stage mm -hmm. and don't get me wrong i miss performing as well but those are the things i miss as well right so during the start of uh, quarantine you were actually still playing sporting life in atlanta correct yes i know we talked about you made it through four of the six shows before everything got called yeah. off um or do you have plans to return back to that role once everything is lifted yes i've um i've had like three contracts that was canceled this year okay um that i one is already is looking to reschedule mm -hmm. and i don't i can't tell you about one that's okay but you'd be happy about where it, where it's at. That's all I'm gonna say. Okay. Okay. Oh, that, okay. That, you know, if if things go, I'm still I'm waiting to hear about that. Sure. You know, you'd be happy about where where it's being performed. How about okay. that? Okay. But um, when I was doing Atlanta, believe it or not, my first Met contract is amazing. My first Met contract is them calling me. Isn't that something? So mm -hmm. they said, "Are you available to come in?" And I say, well, actually, I'm, I've already, I'm already under a contract with Atlanta Opera during that time. They said, we are willing to fly you back and forth to be here to cover um, while doing Atlanta. And they'll pay for my flights. Wow. I asked Atlanta. And they said, we will release you because I knew the, um, the director. And they knew that I knew the road. I mean, they were yeah. doing Francesca's production. It's like, well, Jermaine, you, well, of course, we know you know the road. You've done it. Mm -hmm. So. I would literally would be in New York in rehearsal at the Met, and then I have to leave there, get up, get, um, get on a 6 a.m. flight, fly to Atlanta, do rehearsal at 10 o'clock, finish that rehearsal day that evening, um, and then go to sleep the next day, fly back to New York to be there for a show, and then once the cover, finish, fly the next day morning, fly back to Atlanta. So, oh. yeah. <laughs> That's, That's what I was doing. I was doing both at the same time. That's crazy. I finished the uh, Met run and then I stayed in Atlanta. Okay. Well, good for you, though. That's a huge honor. I mean, that's incredible um, and a huge compliment in itself. And the fact that you can even survive and do that, that's a testament to you, too. And yeah, I bet you're ready to get back on the stage with that kind of energy. If you have that in you, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> yes. But I, I, I don't know if you've seen any of my little clips, but. I still got my toe touches. I've been, I've been stretching. I saw it. I saw the pictures and I want that picture. Seriously. Yes. I will post it up I, everywhere. <laughs> yes, I will send it to you. Please. i tell you another um, experience I had to show you that I know this role is that Cape Town Opera, mm -hmm. South, South Africa, Cape Town Opera was doing the performance and their sporting life, something happened and he had to go to surgery and leave and their cover, they wasn't quite comfortable with them. So I got a call. I had to fly into Berlin. I had to watch 
the production on Saturday, on Friday. I'm sorry. Watched the production on Saturday. I flew in on the on the Thursday. And, uh, and oh no, on the Friday. The next morning, I got up, watched the production, and then the, on Sunday, I watched the second cast. On Monday, fly to Oslo, Norway, for on Tuesday to do uh, opening Oslo, Norway's brand new opera house with this production. Wow. So when I went on stage, I was the only um, African American on the stage with all South Africans, with all Africans. Oh, right. And guess who was my, um, my, um, what part does she play? Okay, Clara, who sings Summertime. Oh. Guess who was my, guess who was my Clara? Pretty, pretty Yindi. Oh. Who's, I don't oh, know if you yeah. know that name. I do. I do. Oh my yes. gosh. Star, star. I have a, I have a, I have a photo I'll send to you. Oh, please While do. we were performing there in Oslo, Norway, it turns out that, here's another historical moment for you. Mm-hmm. Anne Brown, the original best, mm-hmm. settled there because she had married an Olympic ski jumper there. And that's where she resides. And while we were there, Someone was doing a documentary on her. As a matter of fact, it was her last, her last documentary. It was her last moment before she passed. She was like mm-hmm. 98 or something like that. Wow. I was invited, and I have a picture of myself, Pretty Yindi, and the other cast members to go to be and meet Miss Ann Brown. And we were part of this documentary. And I have a picture of me next to her, holding up her original picture mm-hmm. of her being best and taking the picture. And she had a liking to me. I kid you not. Yeah. And, and um, I tell you this story, and I, I, told, uh, <laughs> I told Eric, who did the um, article for the Post, um, and God bless her soul as she rests in peace. Miss mm-hmm. Brown, at, in the end, was developing Alzheimer's. And everyone, you, you, you know, you understand the symptoms, you sympathize. But what was, what was amazing is that when she spoke, you could not tell. Yeah. You know, she was like, hello. You know, she would speak very clear. It was nothing where you felt sorry. Right. And she looked at me, and the lady was doing the, the, um, the, the interview and mm-hmm. interviewing one of the other cast members. And she kept looking at me and saying, I love your hair. <laughs> and I had my dreadlock down. She they said, yes, Ms. Brown, it's okay. It's okay. We're doing the interview. And she's like, okay, I'm sorry. Carry on. <laughs> and then the moments later, she's like, I tell you, young man, you're here. So they told me to go sit next to her. I sat next to her. And then she kept speaking to me, and they said, we're going to mic you, Miss Brown. So, uh, because the area mic was picking her up so they could just turn her mic off. Mm-hmm. Um, I kid you not. I sat next to her and she just looked at me and I felt like she was flirting with me. She was <laughs> yes, like, that's mm-hmm. awesome. And then she kept rubbing my hair. And they would say, are you okay with that? Like, yes, keep keep rolling because otherwise they're going to keep stopping. And um, they said, and then she was like, I still love your hair. And she was trying to whisper, but it was going into her mic. <laughs> she was so lovely. And then when we made it through the interview, um, now we we're sitting having dinner. And she said, um, I would like to try some of that wine there. And they said, sure, Ms. Brown. She said, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> they said, oh, you don't have to drink it. She said, oh, they moved it out the way. And we were sitting there talking. Five minutes later, she said, I would like to try some of that wine. Oh. They said, Brown, you don't like that wine. She said, I, I know what I like. <laughs> <laughs> said, so how can you stop it? She said, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> she put it down. And then they said, I took it away. And then they went back to talking 10 minutes later. Oh, that's precious. She said, yes. And she was telling us the story. I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you the story she told us. And she, the third time she said, I would like to try a little of that one. <laughs> so Miss Brown, you've already tried you one. Said, I would like to try it. But you don't like it. Listen, I know what I like. <laughs> you do not tell me. Please, can I try the wine, please? <laughs> yes, Miss Brown. Thank you. Oh, this is horrible. (laughs) (laughs) I love it, though. 
they said, remove the wine from the table. So they took all the wine off the table so she wouldn't have to try it again. Uh -huh. and, I, and this is the story that she told um, in between. She said that, do you notice that the star wrote Bess, Porgy and Bess, Bess did not have an aria in the entire opera. And um, so she talked to uh, George Gershwin. So she would tell us, she would, she made, how can I say, this is the way she said. <laughs> well, I said, um, George, how is I'm the star, but I don't have an aria. So, well, you know, you're, you, you sing the duets with this. Those are duets. I want my own aria. And she said, when I, after my private talk with him, <laughs> I, I, all of a sudden, we came back. And now Bess is singing the hit song of the entire show. That's why Bess comes back and sings Summertime. Summertime. It is because of Miss Ann Brown. That's amazing. So she's so not only does she get an aria, she gets to sing the hottest and then he lowers it for her, a key. <laughs> so she can sing it comfortably because she's been singing all night. That's amazing. <laughs> she said, and it was lowered for me. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what she said. I like to try some of them more wine. And that's when she went to the new wine <laughs> after the story. How did you keep it together? I did. It was, it was just, how, just talking with her. It's like, it's just like, how can you think, you don't think, you, you, you forget that she is there because she's talking so proper and mm -hmm. so clear. Yeah. It was just amazing. I, she didn't seem sickly like, hey. Yeah. I can't. She wasn't doing anything like that. I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to make a. Fight. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm crying. Real tears. It's fine. I'm sorry. I did not mean that in any way negative. I'm, I apologize. Oh, I was. Oh, I was just trying to say uh -huh. she did not sing handicap. She was talking and speaking clearly. Right. So you you keep forgetting. You you will forget when she tells stories like that you'll forget that's the case. Yeah. So all you have to do is just remove it, remove yeah. it. And that's why the, um, the, 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 they just go with it. They just let her go. So her last years are comfortable. That's, you know, that's just remove the wine. You don't have to, don't fight against the, the disease. Just let her speak freely, mm -hmm. you know, cause she, you would have, you couldn't tell her that she was, mm -hmm. it, it was just amazing. Like I said, it was amazing sitting yeah. there talking. That's awesome. I'm so jealous of your experiences. You have no idea right now. Like, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, and I do want to kind of transition a little bit because I want to use everything that you have experienced to inspire up and coming musicians. So with that rich life that you've had in the musical world, even though it's not something that you initially even realized that you wanted, um, and it was a growth process into discovering yourself through music, how would you encourage or give advice to those who are maybe afraid to put themselves out there or maybe they don't know the avenues to pursue if they are looking to sing? With all that background, what is their present in St. Louis that they can go after to start making, getting their name out there, making their mark and do things afraid? Don't wait until they feel like it's perfect um, and they have all the right connections, but just put themselves out there now. Pause. Okay, I was trying to make a moment where you can pause because my phone is about to die. I'm going to run to get my charger. Sure thing. And you, I, I let you set, finish this so you can pause here and we can clip back in. That's why I didn't do anything. Like You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on one second. Perfect.
Okay. <clears throat> All right. I think that was about a set. Okay. Back. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Let me see. Just I like. Told you, that Listen, I just love to make people laugh. I'm sorry. That's awesome. That, You're good. That, that's, that's what I do. That I feel Take so it. comfortable with that. And once you show me your funny bone, it's oh, over. Oh, I have too many of those, so don't worry. <laughs> so, okay, the answer to your question, to the, I say to young artists that no know what you love to do mm -hmm. if you love to do this really discover that you love to do this because it is a difficult career music in its generals in, in itself and in trying to strive it, it's a difficult career it's a difficult it's a, it's a difficult career to get into because it's based upon someone judging if you are the one for it not that if you have the talent to do it right it's if you are the one that they want to do it Mm -hmm. So you cannot allow you not getting that audition or getting that role to stop you if you love to do this, because it's not necessarily that you are not capable. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily that that you did not get hired because you did something wrong. Sometimes you are not hired based upon small, minute things. What if they've hired one cast member already? And you're taller than the other cast member. So they can't hire it to throw that up. It, it has become now where it used to be, you know, it's not over until the fat lady sings, you know, the, the, the Wagnerian opera, the big lady, you know, used to have that where as long as you had a voice, it did not matter. And that's, that's why they use that phrase fat lady because it's, no, it wasn't based upon your looks. It was based upon the voice but now hollywood has entered into the opera world mm -hmm. when i heard that deborah voigt and i heard her perform pre um her change her body change when she was a nice healthy mm -hmm. young girl and i saw i heard her at the metropolitan opera singing in lauren the voice was so incredible oh my goodness it was like she was singing next to me and i understand later in the career she was fired by a director based upon her size hmm. and it went with that they went with the director and once again it was a size it has nothing to do with her talent mm -hmm. yes hollywood has entered into our world now she she did the make she made changes and now she's now looks you know i'm trying to i'm trying to speak so that i'm not speaking oh, yeah. in a negative way but mm -hmm. um and she did all of those things and, it's, and if it's great for her phenomenal right. and it, it, there was a change in the voice it does not and i heard up and then i heard her afterwards i heard i heard the cover model mm -hmm. Boy, because i remember after that she was on the cover of opera news and i i was blown away by her transformation and after that, for me, for me personally, it, the sound changed a little because mm -hmm. you have to understand she changed. You changed the structure. You changed the sound a little. Mm -hmm. And um, and I don't know. All of a sudden, I, I didn't. Her career. I don't know what happened. She's. I don't know. I'll say it like that. Mm -hmm. But my 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 whole point of saying all of that is that, based upon looks, mm -hmm. sometimes when you are auditioning or you're not getting something. It's not that you're not the you don't have the talent. Mm -hmm. It's just that, that that's what there was a choice at the time because our career is based upon a person's opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you get quality, sometimes not. Sometimes someone will get hired for you hear something and you say to yourself, "How did that person get it?" Mm -hmm. You know, the way they're singing. Well, sometimes some contracts are three years out. Mm -hmm. I've had contracts where I was two years out, three years out, a year out at least. So anything could have happened within that year. So when that person goes to perform, the voice is not where it's at when they did the audition. Yeah. So I just don't want you to believe that 
you hear people singing and sometimes you hear performances not as great as you think they should be. And, and how did they get it and you didn't? Maybe they sang different during the audition. I want you to understand that there's also possibilities that that the color, the, that the color of the voice, that the sound, it, it, it can be so many things that goes into the choosing of any person who's auditioning for any role. That's why I say, if you love this, you have to understand, or not understand, make a decision at what level do you want to sing this? Mm -hmm. Because sometimes some levels require you to do things that you may not like. Like with the Deborah Voice situation, if you don't lose yourself, don't lose yourself in this. Mm -hmm. Don't lose the love of singing and love of music. It's very difficult. It, I, I don't see it as a career that everybody gets to be the star. Mm -hmm. It's almost, think of it like in Hollywood. I, I kid you not, it's entered. Everybody that's in Hollywood is not a superstar. Right. You have a lot of stars in Hollywood, but you don't have as many superstars. You, well, let me, let me say this. You have a lot of superstars, but you're understanding that it's like each one graduate. You, don't have a, you have a lot of superstars, but they're older. Mm -hmm. You know, some superstars, some people that are superstars now in Hollywood, they're in their late 60s. Yeah. But, you know, they do everything to keep younger, keep it, keep it looking nice. Mm -hmm. And so you think that, wow, they, they're great. They're a superstar. But you're not realizing how long they've been in the game. Yeah. You, you go back and see they were, they were in movies. They were in little shorts. Like think, so Samuel L. Jackson has been in so many movies. Like you can't even count them. You can go back and see him playing little small roles. Mm -hmm. Now that he's in his latter, you know, nice, nice aged years, prime years, you know, he's he's right on the other side of prime, but he has a, enough wisdom of how to perform mm -hmm. that the, with with makeup, with with digitalizing, now they can change looks, make people look younger. Mm -hmm. They're superstars, but to understand that they have not, they've been through it. So it just so happens that as a singer, we have a limited time with our voice, but you don't have a limited time with our voice. I'm going to say that twice mm -hmm. because it depends on how you take care of your instrument. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes a difference that you can sing well into your 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. So take care of your instrument. Know this to be something that you love and love the ideal of performing. If it can work for your career, if it can work for your lifestyle, I've had to make sacrifices. I've talked about the many stories I have, but you don't see the other side. Mm -hmm. I've traveled. I can tell you about Japan. I can tell you about all through Europe, from France, Germany, Spain. I can tell you about so many beautiful places I've seen. But I can also tell you that I missed out on so many homegrown service of ones who was close to me as a mother or a father. I can tell you I missed out on my son singing at his graduation, well, not his graduation, but his promotion. He was in eighth grade. I remember him um, wanting to sing, and I worked with his voice. He won. He did scored high on his his his, his competition, and then it was they was he was asked to sing at the graduation at the graduation. But I was away performing, and I was talking to him one day. He's in college now, and this we're talking about eighth grade. I said, "Is there anything that you regret that I've not, or anything any regrets?" He said, you know, Dad, I really regret that you wasn't there when I sang at my eighth grade uh, graduation. I said, what do you mean? I, you, you learned the song because of me. I helped you get that, you know? He said, yeah, I know, but it's different. I know I did it. You was there for the competition, everything like that. But I, I really wanted you there for that. Hmm. My, other, my, my other son, his first recital as, as, a, as a, um, a bass, a double hmm. bass, I wasn't there. Someone had to, had to record it for me because I was away performing. I've been out of my children's lives a lot so that they've gotten to the point where they're used to it. Mm -hmm. I'm in my second marriage mm -hmm. because of, a career, of my career. Mm -hmm. My first marriage, their, their mother, I understood it was hard. We went 10 years strong and it's, it was too much. You know, we started growing apart. So understand the sacrifices on one side that you have to make. Know that is, this is something you love to do. Because with all the fame and glory on one side, 
there's also sacrifice. Yeah. I have sacrificed my career to be more than what it is because I wanted to be in my son's lives. Mm -hmm. I have so many more opportunities to do other roles other than sporting life. I mean, but I knew the more roles that I did, the more opportunities and chances I may be away. Mm -hmm. So I chose to focalize on, I chose to focus on this one role to perfect it, to be the best at what I do mm -hmm. in, in anything I choose to do. And, and I've had a career with this role. And some people on another side, this is, I'm getting off tr um, track just a little bit, but I want to say this. For a lot of um, young black singers, some people say, be careful, Porgy and Bess. You know, don't get typecast. They see you sing Porgy and Bess. They, they think that's all you can do. And they won't hire you for any other operas. We know that the realm of, of, of uh, the opera world is now, as you can see in a lot of the media today, the truths are coming out. That's why I said this quarantine is a time of truth mm -hmm. across the board. You can see how a lot of companies are talking now against the discrimination. Mm -hmm. As the latest thing with the Richard Tucker Award, where now there was a board member who was um, as communicated out of the board because of remarks that he made. It, it is being, yes, there's change is starting to happen and it's starting to surface. You know, and I wanted to say, I never listened to that don't worry about getting typecast because I believe when I get on that stage, I'm going to give my all mm -hmm. where you will see a performer. And that's what I've done. Singing sport, singing Porgy and Bess, usually Porgy and Bess and maybe Serena, who does a big giant opera, Aria, My Man's Gone. Mm -hmm. um, you can hear that voice. Those are the usually the characters who get asked to do house auditions on a lot of tours I've been on and a lot of other things, you know, but as sporting life, I've been asked by almost every house I sang in, will you be willing to come and sing in a house audition mm. or do more? Because I stay true to my voice, yeah. true to my talent, true, mm. true to my, um, my voice, my acting, my, I stay true to my character mm -hmm. in all its glory. So I feel like no matter what I do, you're going to get it all. When I did my, when I was doing my master's program, I remember my first role was Puck. I remember they put up the audition sheet and it was my first year and he has a couple um, you know, a couple of kids in there was in their second year. And they were arrogant, you know, and all they was like, Oh, this guy is Muslim. Oh, I see you have Puck. <laughs> but be happy, at least you have a role. <laughs> Not singing. And I said, Yes, well yeah, thank you. I'm happy for that. Yeah. Thank you. And I took that role and I remember the director not really working with me because he spent a lot of time with everybody else, kept telling me, I'm going to get to you, get back to you. Mm -hmm. I just had to create on my own. And when I got on that stage, I did my thing. And the, and the press release was New England Conservatory. It's done a phenomenal production of A Midsummer Night's Dream. And they went all out for it that they even hired in a professional actor and performer to do their puck. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yes. Is that I take what and, and one of my friends in the in the um in the opera department at New England Conservatory said to me, you know, Jermaine, I know you don't get the roles that you should be getting because there was discrimination. He, he said, but I tell you, I tell you, whatever role you get, you just take it and man, you make the most of it. Mm -hmm. It's like you almost still a show. The other opera we did was Three Penny Opera. Was not in it. I did not have a role, but the other guy who could not sing it, they kept pressing him, mm -hmm. and he lost his voice. So I had to learn it at the last minute. <laughs> once again, I just come in and do my staging. Yeah, I did it, and once again, I make it happen. So for me, I don't consider myself a tenor, mm -hmm. an opera singer, or whatever. I consider myself a performer. Mm -hmm. And if you love to do this. Remember, the first love about it is that you love to give, mm -hmm. perform. Now, just decide on what level. And know that every time you go up a level, you're going to have to let go something. Mm -hmm. In order for something to rise, you have to cut, cut loose something. So as high as you go, as high as sacrifices may be made. I don't want to sound negative with it, yeah. but understand, it's just true. Reality. Yes, it is reality. Mm -hmm. There are sacrifices that has to be made. That, that you have to make them in order to get there. Mm -hmm. And that's just what it is. 
So yes, every young singer, you have that opportunity. Everybody has the opportunity, uh, opportunity to be whoever they want to be. Mm-hmm. Just decide on what level you want to be and know that the higher the level, the more the sacrifice. Yeah. And I think that's really valuable too. In, in a lot of the conversations that I've had, we've all talked about redefining success. Um, I know that young singers start out with this stars in the eyes idea of success, and I'm going to make it to the top and I'm going to be a superstar and realizing that as you go through that, um, it's not everything that you thought it would be. It's not everything that you really want. And maybe it is. Maybe for some people that top rung is exactly where you want to be. But understand that you can still have happiness and satisfaction without achieving the world's standard of success. And whatever success looks like for you, whether or not that is your parents' idea of success or your teacher's idea of success, as long as you are happy, as long as you are fulfilled in what you're doing and feel like you're living out your purpose, then that success for you um love it Mm -hmm. my my quote this morning that i posted today said um you can achieve let me see give me one second yeah i want to make sure i say it right sure i want to say i I, you're still there right you can still Mm -hmm. see me Mm -hmm. you're frozen on a very lovely picture of your face okay I just want to pull this up to make sure I say it correctly because mm-hmm. I don't want to rattle because it, I, I, okay. One can achieve if you unleash the reality of others and exist in your own, guided by your soul. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know what just happened. That's okay. It was so powerful. Uh, it mic dropped itself. And then, uh, that's, <laughs> oh, I love it. <laughs> it's so funny. It's so true. I, it's so true. I think we're in the room. We will have a riot. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. One can achieve if one, um, y- y- as I just um, said, mm-hmm. if your existence is not based upon others, and sometimes we base our achievements, we base our our goals are what we think based upon another. One person's career. Like we started off together. What they're doing, I'm not doing. Mm-hmm. It's not. It's not necessarily that. Mm-hmm. I Morris Morris Robertson, who's one of the, the most outstanding, ba- you know, mm-hmm. bases out there today. That every people. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Just throwing me around the room there. It's fine. <laughs> you know what? You know what it is is that I had to put my charge on, and I'm. Mm-hmm. I was trying to sit in. Struggling. I'm, 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 I'm crossing my legs. I'm stretching. I'm sorry. Um, my point is that um, I met him when I was in my, in my uh, master's program, and he was well, in, like in, in his thirties, I believe, where he was a, uh, he was over sales. Mm-hmm. He was just sing around at friends, fraternity brothers' weddings, and someone told him, "Man, you really have something. You should." go look into it. and his wife encouraged him. So he came, he went into the continue education mm-hmm. part of the conservatory. Okay. Mind you, this is where you have those uh, great, beautiful elderly community coming in, singing a little, you know, uh-huh. theater and stuff like that. And he was there singing. And I think it was Patricia Craig was over uh, Boston Opera Institute program, mm-hmm. came and heard, was, went to see a friend who did a, directed something small something there and the little scenes and she went there and support and saw Morris and said, what are you doing singing here like this? And he said, oh, I'm just, you know, trying to learn. She said, if you come to Opera Institute right now, I promise you I'll give you scholarship. We can develop. He went there. His first role was Bluebeard. Mm-hmm. He went to go and sing um, in the chorus, to get into the chorus of Boston Lyric Opera. Mm-hmm. And he went in, sang a song and I believe it's Stephen Lauren and said, do you have anything else? He said, no, I just only have that one song. <laughs> he said, go and learn this song and come back. He went and learned. He came back. He sang it. His next role, he was the king in Aida at Boston oh. Lyric. Oh. Now, mind you, he, he did not grow up in music school and all of that kind of things growing up and going to young artist programs. Mm-hmm. None of that. And then his next thing, you know, he did the uh, Metropolitan Opera audition. I remember that year I was there. He didn't win. 
Mm-hmm. He got third place in the regional, mm-hmm. you know, and the other, others moved on. Then they asked him from third place regionals to go into the program. Wow. <laughs> so my point is that your path is your own. Mm-hmm. Do not judge what you're doing, your accomplishments and your achievements and your goals that you're reaching based upon someone else. Mm-hmm. Your path is your own. Yeah. And I saw that path. His path had nothing to do with a regular style, regular way. Now for others, the path is school, 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 young artists, young artists, boom, 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 making it, making it through that. My point is that it does not matter. It don't, 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 there is no formula. Right. There, the, the only formula is you knowing who you are and what you do at your best. Right. And you go out and you do that. Mm-hmm. Know your lane, stay in your lane, mm-hmm. and drive your lane. Mm-hmm. And I promise you, it would lead right to success. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When someone tries to do something, and when I said in that quote, you can achieve mm-hmm. if you allow yourself that your reality is not based upon a, another person's ideal of what your existence is, but it's mm-hmm. based upon your own by you listening to your soul. When I say listening to your soul, that's that we call it ourselves or my intuition or something told me. Mm-hmm. Sometimes people offer you a role. Oh, you should do, be doing this. Oh, you have such a big voice. You should do this. And now you feel something's like, Mm-hmm. You sing through it and something is telling you, oh, this is a little too much. I shouldn't do this. Mm-hmm. No, no, no. I'm telling you, you're fine. You're just starting it. If something is telling you no, mm-hmm. listen to that something. That's your soul. That's your self speaking. Mm-hmm. That is you staying on your road because you end up doing that of another person's ideal of a role for you. Yeah. And then something will not work right. Why? Because that's somebody else's role they're projecting upon you. Right. Find your role. Mm-hmm. Find your role and your road. Mm-hmm. Find the roles that work for you, mm-hmm. not the roles that are told to be given unto you. Now, as a young singer, of course, you're going to hear me giving great advice. But once you gain, you must stop mm-hmm. and listen to yourself. And, and you will feel it. Mm-hmm. You will feel like, oh, this is not right. Right. And something's not right. Mm-hmm. Listen to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are, and then the last piece is that there are people out there that are cutthroat. I I go to an audition, yeah. and I tell you, this is well. I guess you can you can still do it today. I used to take my earphones. I would take my earphones, and I literally would walk, and I put my I have my earphones in. And, and my earphones would be in my pocket, not connected to anything. Mm-hmm. It's just plugged in my pocket yeah. because some people will come in and they'll be nervous and they'll talk. They'll try to talk. They're nervous. They'll yeah. try to protect their energy, their nervous energy onto you. They, they, would, they would try to do mind things. They'll mm-hmm. try to, whatever, whatever insecurities they have, they will look for more people to, yeah. to join in, to, to, to colonize together. Mm-hmm. no. Know what you came to do. Mm-hmm. And then this is the thing about an audition. You practice in a room, the practice room. Mm-hmm. Whatever you practice, how you practice is how you perform. Yes. You hear that all the time. But I'm saying seriously, when I practiced in my room, I made sure I pretended as if I was performing. Mm-hmm. So when I go in to audition, I don't have to do anything extra. Mm-hmm. I only have to do what I practice. Do what you know mm-hmm. and let it flow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You don't have to give something extra at the audition. Yeah. No, what you have to give is what you, what you know. And then it will go. And if you just sit there and, and, and when you get there and performing and you go in what you're knowing, you will find yourself in those moments, like singing the notes. Oh, then you're like, oh my goodness. Mm-hmm. You know, you just, you, all you're doing is what you practice, mm-hmm. but since you, have de- you, since you have developed your body and all your skills to the point where you can actually be thinking mm-hmm. as you perform, you can be in yourself performing and speaking to yourself and, mm-hmm. okay, yes, okay, now go over here. Oh my, and, oh, right here. Here's mm-hmm. that part coming up. Oh, oh mm-hmm. there it is. Now I, now I can hold it. I can decide to hold it longer because all of a sudden I have more breath. Yeah. Because you, all you're doing is what you practice and your body said, okay, I got that. Yes. I got the practice part now. 
Mm-hmm. Now it's just like it's like when you first start riding a bike or when you first start driving. First mm-hmm. you like nine o'clock, three o'clock, <laughs> yeah. all, it's all like this. And then after a while, you just you you're comfortable. You're not thinking. When you're right. riding the bike, you're like this. And then after a while, you don't even think. Mm-hmm. You're just riding the bike, talking, you know, mm-hmm. moving about because your body has now got that cover where yeah. you can do the extra. So you practice till you have it down. Mm-hmm. So your body has it covered. Mm-hmm. Muscle memories, they're in place. Yep. Then you can do extra. Mm-hmm. But you go in just doing what you practice and in the moment, mm-hmm. in the moment of the performance, of the audition, of the time that you're giving yeah. is where you have these special moments that you can go into deeper because everything else has been covered. All the other bases are covered. Mm-hmm. Now you can hit grand slams. Mm-hmm. But you I cannot am- go in Yes. With the bases, one or two people, one one man on base, yeah. you know, and then trying to go in and hit a grand slam. You don't have the bases covered yet. Right. Right. Do you mm-hmm. understand that analogy? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah. I'm smiling so big inside because I'm highlighting this portion because I want my students specifically to hear this because I tell them this all the time. They look at me like I'm crazy because I make them get uncomfortable before they have to be uncomfortable in front of someone else. Um, And so we do everything, you know, we practice walking in, stating your name. We practice looking at people in the eye. I set up pillows and I'm like, here are the people that are judging you. You know, here's your audition crew. And I want you to pick a a face there. And I want you to sing to that person. I want you to put on your character. I want you to do every nuance. And um, we do that over and over and over again until it becomes muscle memory. And then when they go on for the audition, they're like, I wasn't even nervous. I was like, oh, that's so weird. I told you that would happen. (laughs) Listen, anytime. Listen, I throw it out there. I would love if you ever want to do a master class. I'm there. I'm there for you. Yeah. Listen, I love that. I love working with students because they think about the they they think about the finish line so much. They forget mm-hmm. get even they, they they forget to get in the starting blocks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They just start running, Preach. not even set up their starting blocks. Yes. I, was, I used to run track, so mm-hmm. you know I, 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 you have to you have to have it set up. I let me tell you. Let me tell you <laughs> what I did in my master's program. I used to go to school early. I'll go to school early to practice. When I, I was a baritone throughout all school, I was a baritone. Then when I graduated, I didn't become a tenor. So all the repertoire I learned in school, I can't even do it. But I can actually do it if I choose. Um, when I was learning the Largo, I factored them. I, 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 I used to sit there riding on the train. Largo, Fortorte de la Chita, Largo, la 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 la. I'll just say, I'll just say the words on the tonic. And so now it, it was in my mouth to where now mind you, I have not sang this yep. since 2003. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, actually 2002. Yeah, two, no, my son, 2001, because my, my first son, 2001. Mm-hmm. But I can sing it right now. Just like it did, because I spent that time every day. I used to get up early. I would go to my practice room. I would open up the windows. It's cold outside. And I get the room all cold, the cold air is in there. I say to myself, just in case I go into an audition, they have the air yeah. conditioner. I want to be able to be able to stand and sing. I used to awesome. create conditions mm-hmm. so that I can be so prepared. I love whenever that. I go to an audition, mm-hmm. whenever I go to audition, I try to arrive almost two, three hours early. Yeah. I know it sounds crazy because then sometimes the room is not even there. Mm-hmm. I mean, people are not ready. I said, yep. when is the first, when is the first audition that says nine? I try to get there by seven 30 because then I can go in the room. I've gone, when I did my audition for New England conservatory, I arrived early enough where I saw the janitor. <laughs> and then I said, well, they're doing the uh, audition. I said, I believe in this room. I went in the room. I walked around. All rooms have a hot spot. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Where if you go in and you sing, you know, you sound like you can hear yourself, the echo in this, of the yep. hot spot. I went in, found that spot, comfortable, not saying, and mm-hmm. then I left. So then when it came time my audition, I walked in, I've already been here. Mm-hmm. I know where yes. to go. Yes. Nothing is new. Mm-hmm. I try to eliminate the new experience. I try to eliminate anything so my body is there knowing what to do. Yeah. So when it comes time to perform, I'm riding my bike without even thinking, now I can decide I can pop a willy. Right. You know, yeah. you know, I can jump, I can do tricks because everything is comfortable. Yes. 
I even, I, it sounds really silly, but I even have them come in in the outfit that they're going to be wearing. And especially yes. for the girls, wear the high heels. It changes your posture. And even that little subtle yes. thing can throw you so off. So know how your clothes fit that day and how that feels and become that character. And oh yeah, so down to the absolute smallest, minute detail. Yes, because mm -hmm. if you wear an outfit that is too flashy, mm -hmm. they are not listening to you. They're looking at the outfit. Right? Mm -hmm. If you wear something that has a lot of, Mm -hmm. patterns and you you moving this they're start saying man the patterns moving up they're not listening yeah. that's a distraction or they're grabbing the ends of their sleeves because their sleeves are long and i'm like what you yes. doing you can't put that away you know <laughs> all of all mm -hmm. of those things mm -hmm. all of those things when you walk in that's why i work my students i walk in i said what are you looking at you know you're looking that way you, you're looking down mm -hmm. you're looking defeated you have to understand this mm -hmm. young singers understand this when you go into an audition they're hoping that you are the one. Mm -hmm. Some you don't go into audition saying, "Okay, okay, understand this. This is next level here. You're not in Sunday school anymore. You're not singing a <laughs> little speech and like Jesus well, oh, you know nothing. You're not you're not singing. Um, you know those little songs where everybody encouraging. They don't want." To say, oh, okay. It's, if you sing, it's okay. Okay, we're here. Keep trying. Right. No, they don't want. They don't want somebody. They they're hoping. Yeah. They want that person to come in with the confidence, so they can. Could you imagine your biggest singer? Could you imagine Beyonce coming in with this apologetic type right. spirit, like, "Hello, uh, I'm gonna try to sing today," and um, <laughs> I'm so nervous. Okay, okay, yes. uh -huh. okay. I, no. I, right. I don't want, I, I want to be, I want to go in and enjoy a performance. Mm -hmm. So you have to go into your auditions knowing who you are, knowing that character, knowing everything about it. Knowing, yes. So you, I tell my students, drop, when you come up, you're not yourself anymore. You are mm -hmm. the character up until that moment, mm -hmm. until five or six seconds, until not five, about, until mm -hmm. like five five or four four or five seconds when the music dissipates yes you you, you have to stay because you can captivate your audience you understand the gift that you're giving it's mm -hmm. the it's like the closest thing to god is like an angel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. singing it's a powerful gift if you know and understand this it's power yeah. And if you use it correctly, you can move someone. Mm -hmm. You can take them away from their stress for whatever's going on and take them to another moment and with your singing with their moment. Don't go in up, trying to gain, oh, hello, being nice. Don't get me wrong. You don't go in being nice. It's respectful, yes, but it's not being nice. You go, and I'm not trying to say you go in, I'm a diva. Right. This is my right. No, no, no. It's not that either. It's mm -hmm. going in knowing that I'm about to take you to another place mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that's the and gift of being a performer them. right there that is the beauty of the job that you are doing yes. is to make people feel something um to take them away from whatever that sorrow is in that moment to bring them joy and that ultimately that is success there you go if you have moved someone at the end of the day one person in a crowd of hundreds or thousands then you've done your job and i tell you what you just said no matter where i perform Every day, no matter where, I have performed for, I think my biggest audience was, um, when we did it uh, at Washington, they, they did a live broadcast and they had, a, had it out in, the, um, out in the lawn and they set up chairs and it big giant performance. So it was like over 20, they said they had over 19,000 people watching at the time, something crazy like that, mm -hmm. because it was people on the inside. And they had all the people out on the lawn at, up there. So mm -hmm. one, my point is that I gave what I gave for that performance. And then I was asked to sing for, I hear music. Okay, I was making, yeah. I was making sure my, my, um, Oh, you're good. You're good. Start. Okay. Um, I, I had to sing for an event. Someone asked me to sing for, it was a small wedding, probably about five people, 10 people. I did everything that I would do to perform for 
my performance of sixteen to nineteen thousand. Yeah. I give integrity yeah. to any time I perform. It does mm-hmm. not matter where I perform, but they will get my best. Mm-hmm. That one or two or that thousand. Because that one or two can tell your name to someone else, to someone anytime I open my mouth, I make sure it's gonna be top quality. Yeah. I don't play with it. When people say, Oh, you're singing, sing something. I said, Oh, you're a cash register, bring something. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, no, don't my this is my this is what I do. Mm-hmm. This is yeah, it's just not because some, some people think since it's singing, you know, they don't think it to be anything. Anybody can just sing. Right. Respect your craft. Have the integrity that it doesn't matter if you there's an audience of one, mm-hmm. there's an audience of a hundred thousand, you give. And when you give, you let you you make sure you communicate with the audience. I, I never believed in the just look over their heads. Right. And, no, I believe of connecting because it's not it's not me, it's the character. Yeah. The character. Then sometimes the character maybe you have more than one character on stage. Maybe you're speaking to this character. Maybe that was the past. Maybe that was that was then this is the, this is the future. That's mm-hmm. the present. I mean, you have to see these moments. Yeah. I tell my students. Um, what, when you're singing a song, who are you singing to? I'm singing to Juliet right now. What is she wearing? What do you mean, what is she wearing? You have to have visualization in your eyes because your eyes look different. That's yes. what I mean. Hold the integrity to your performance. Hold the integrity to that. This is something I love to do. And I have a gift and power to take my audience member of one or of many to another place. When, when, not, when No matter what stress they may be dealing with inside, I'm about to take you away for a moment and you can breathe mm-hmm. so you can go back and address mm-hmm. the stress. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's, that's how I, I, I tell a young singer, you take it that serious. You learn your craft so that you know it. Know that you're, don't just say, I got my five warriors. I, go, I, I got my language down. I know right. I memorized them. I don't want them just memorized. Right. Can you just speak them to me? Mm-hmm. As a character, mm-hmm. as if these are your own words. Speak them mm-hmm. right now. Yep. Um, um, largo factotum de la chita. No, 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 you saying them in rhythm. Mm-hmm. Largo factotum de la chita. Mm-hmm. Largo. You know, yeah. la, 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 la. <laughs> you know, I, I need, uh, um, I need you to speak them um, avant de quitter ce lieu. Avant de quitter, no, no, avant de, no, just mm-hmm. speak it. Mm-hmm. Avant de quitter ce lieu. Mm-hmm. You know, speak them as if these are your own words. Right. Der Vogelfänger bin ich ja, das lustige Kaiser Hopsasa. Der Vogelfänger bin ich ja. No, der Vogel, no, der Vogelfänger bin ich ja, das lustige Kaiser Hopsasa. Ich Vogelfänger bin bekannt bei Alt und Jung im ganzen Land. So that now when you communicate. So magical. <laughs> yes, now when you get up there to perform, someone would say, that person has an incredible voice, but yeah. Oh, yeah. oh, that's a beautiful voice. I, I want them to not say, oh, that was beautiful. Right. I want them to say, oh, my goodness. I saw it. I saw what you saw. That's what my- I try to get my students to do. I said, you got to paint me a picture with your words. Like, if, this, yeah. if we had no set, if we had nothing else, you know, pre-story that it's your really- audience knows about, I need you to paint me the picture with your words so I can be there with you and see what you see. And Take that, me away. Bring yeah. me into your dream. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Come on, Freddy Krueger. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it takes them a while to get that. But then when you see the light come on and the complete change in their character and the presence, it's like that's the moment I live for as a teacher. That's the most And I, I tell them, our audience does not know you made a mistake unless you tell them. Right. Because I had a friend when we did the the Nats competition, mm-hmm. we went to the regional level, and I went to his competition. And by the way, competitions are nothing but opportunities mm-hmm. to perform and practice in your performance and to get if constructive you win, criticism. That's, mm-hmm. If you win, that's a fringe benefit. Yes. Let me tell you, I didn't win when I did. Uh, the regionals NAS competition, but I believe that is where someone heard me, where I got the call to mm-hmm. do the Houston Grand Opera that started my whole sport life career. Wow. Okay. Wow. Okay. I did not win. I made it past. I didn't make it. I made. I didn't make it past round one. Mm-hmm. 
But after that, a month or so later, that's when I got the call. I had not sang for anything else. I didn't audition for anything. How did they call me? Yeah. How did they have my information? Yeah. They had my information from that. Wow. And so I'm saying, when you go to sing for a competition, that's an, ar- that's an audition. Someone out there may be listening. Mm-hmm. And so I give it all time. And I don't care about winning. Because yeah. sometimes in competitions, they'll get back there. And one just say, I like the bass. Mm-hmm. They'll say, well, I like the soprano. Well, I don't believe the soprano should get it. I don't think the bass should get it. Okay, we'll give it to the tenor. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you've been thinking, how did that? You went, yeah. come the house, and like, how did he win? Yeah. I sure he thought it was going to be the soprano. I thought it was going to be the bass. You're right. How did the tenor win? <laughs> and that is what happens back there. Yes. That's why I say it is. It, if you win, it's French benefit. Yep. You you go and do your gift. Yes. Perform. Yes. And I think that's really valuable too, is at the end of the day, you can go on as many auditions and network with as many people as possible. And those things are fantastic. Those things are necessary, but the heart yes. of everything that you do is to remain faithful and constantly be looking for opportunities and putting yourself out there, um, honing your craft and then letting your character and your work speak for itself. So at the end of the day, it's you showing up, believing in your gift, and then what's meant to be will fall in place. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. 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 And more. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yes, go into a competition. All of those are grounds. Yes. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. And you go in to be true. You go in and to perform. That's the other thing. All this look over their heads and listen, go in and perform. Mm -hmm. Anytime you open your mouth to sing, Mm -hmm. it's an opportunity to take somebody into your dream. Mm -hmm. I was trying to make that rhyme. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) Totally got it. We could end it right there. And it's just so powerful. Yes. yes it's so beautiful um and i could just you know spend forever and ever and ever just talking to you in your own experiences and then having that understanding with you also being a teacher and me i'm just like yes 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 preach go say this and do that and there's been so many moments where i've just been like yay take it away yes. um so thank you so much. I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up here. And then I do want to extend the conversation um, whenever you feel like you want to give me more of your time. Um, I have several Anytime. opportunities to throw your way because I have Anytime. a whole list of things that I want to continue to ask you. Um, but I don't, you know, just for the sake of this not being four hours, because it could be four hours. <laughs> I'm going to wrap it there um, and then end. Is there anything specific that you want to end with or a final thought? I just said it. What did mm-hmm. I just say? <laughs> it rhymed so um, well. <laughs> whenever, uh, whenever you get up to sing, it's an opportunity to allow your audience into your dream. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I love so that. So as you said, you said, bring them into your painting with, yeah. with your world. Mm-hmm. Know that. Mm-hmm. And that's, really, that's, that's period. Whenever I get up to sing, I, and every time I sing, it's like it's new. Yeah. I don't care if I sing the same aria over again. Just like you get up each day, you feel a little different. Mm -hmm. Understand that you may sing it different that day. Mm -hmm. Don't push your voice. Like, I know I can do this. I did it yesterday. Ah, just stop. Yeah. Stop. Maybe that burger you ate last night is still digested. (laughs) (laughs) You know what I'm saying? You you understand. That's when I said, the the higher you get with your career, the understand the sacrifices you made. Yeah. I I say this. I don't want to get off and talk it again, but just Mm -hmm. to, to prove a point. I used to talk like this real low all the time and all of my chords and fry in my chords. <laughs> but that is not good because I used to talk sexy, you know, I wouldn't mm-hmm, talk sexy. Mm-hmm. But that's not good to the chords because mm-hmm. then when I warm up, I got to get it all the way up. Mm-hmm. Huh. So now when I start changing my talk, people are like, you talk funny. My mm-hmm. laugh, I used to laugh real hard. Like, ah, ah. And you just, yeah. you know, hope. now I was in my master's program. I changed my laugh. I was like, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> or the opera lab to get off the court. Yes. I, 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 all the things to help change, to make it, because you're working to make sure that instrument is, that is ready to go at any moment. Yeah. So that it requires sacrifice. It's not just, just so quick. Yeah. Your youth right now are muscles mm-hmm. where you push through it. But mm-hmm. those muscles will start to mm-hmm. not have that quick recovery as they yeah. usually do. That's why you have to understand the technique. I tell mm-hmm. someone, yes, you, you're gifted, mm-hmm. but 
gift can only take you so far. Right. Talent can take you so much further. Mm -hmm. Gift take you, it's, it's beautiful in middle school. Sometimes in high school, you, you start fading once you get to college. And once yeah. you get out, it's not gift anymore. Everybody can sing. Yeah. So it's not gift. So do not get construed about what people have said. Yeah. No, learn your talent, learn your craft, learn your skills so that you can develop. Even, even, even LeBron James has a coach. Yeah. You know, even the greatest sports um, person or any singer, even Pavarotti, even yeah. Marilyn Horn, all of them, they had callous. They had someone who have coached them. So it's not about what you know. Yeah. It's about how you grow. Mm-hmm. Oh, I love that. There's the rhyme too. Look at you spitting those rhymes. That's amazing. <laughs> those are my quotes. You know, if you was on my Facebook page, you'll see me every now and then I put out a quote. Which does bring me to the point that I want my students and listeners to be able to follow you, to be able to follow your journey and to get motivation because you're so inspirational. So where can they find you online? Well, I'm, listen, I don't have any cool Instagram names because when it first came out, I thought, <laughs> what's your Instagram handle? Um, Jermaine Smith. Yes, that's <laughs> Jermaine okay. Smith, Jermaine Smith 73, like the email I, I did. Because <laughs> it was the email at the time. Wow, I love it. <laughs> and so that's what it is. And it's, Facebook's just Jermaine Smith. It's just, it's just what it is. And well, I'm you okay know what? Since you helped Kaya out with his Instagram handle, he's gonna have to return the favor. That's you don't understand. Kaya tells me somebody we were we were performing somewhere, and someone said, "What's your Instagram?" I said, "Um," and Kaya said, "It's listen. He doesn't even know it. It's Jermaine Smith seventy three. He doesn't even know it's on Instagram." <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love it. We had a good laugh too over um, his Instagram handle. So if you haven't had a chance to watch that yet, we definitely shouted you out. Um, I'll send it to you. But yeah, no, we'll, we'll work on that. Don't worry. But for now, Jermaine Smith 73 on Instagram and Jermaine Smith on Facebook, correct? Yeah, Jermaine Smith 73. I think that's right. Yeah, I remember okay. Kaya sent it to someone. Okay. So that has to be it. And then anything so, YouTube? No, I've never, I've never gotten into that. That's the thing about it. Yeah, I just never. What? I never thought, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just, I, I, because I, I'm always doing when I'm asked. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And when it needs to be done, I get it done. So what if I you ask know? you? So what do you want me to do? Start a YouTube see? channel. See? Okay. And it could contain like motivational things that you've learned for artists, as well as <laughs> showcasing what you've done. See, well, well, we'll talk about that as my um, producer, mm -hmm. um, and you tell me what you produce, and then mm -hmm. we go from there. See that? I already have see? ideas. You have no idea. Yeah. I'm an idea machine. So, well, see, I've been told by friends that oh my goodness, um, one of my coaches, Gail, um, Gail Hens, mm -hmm. um, Gail Andrews. Now, she, um, if she's back to her maiden name, her, 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 her original name, mm -hmm. it's um, she said, "Well, what, Jermaine." Um, have you ever thought about being an inspirational speaker? I say, like, inspiration. Yeah, what are you talking about? She's like, you speak so well. So what I've done, there are times I go do inspirational talk scenes. Oh. Well, I'll go, I'll go to a college or a high school, mm -hmm. and sometimes I go and you know I let my dreadlocks down. I wear jeans. Yes. I walk on the stage, <laughs> and I just pop all sorts of singing opera. And yes. like they're sort of laughing, but I'll keep singing. Mm -hmm. And then by the end, they're like, wow. Mm -hmm. They said, where are, you, where are you from? Africa. I said, no, <laughs> uh, I am from St. Louis, Missouri. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no. You know, so, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell them my story. I'll tell them my story that someone saw something in me that I did not see in myself. Mm -hmm. And until I was able to believe in myself, I believed in what someone said until I was able to believe in myself because I had to step outside of my comfort zone, right. my box. To go into some a place that I've never been, mm -hmm. and I've it opened up a whole new world where I was able to take my first paychecks was to I brought I bought I, I saved all my money mm -hmm. from that first gig with Houston Grand Opera, mm -hmm. and I came back and put on the down payment for a house for my mom. Oh, that's and so then, sweet. You know, I was able to do things for my mom that who raised two boys, a single parent, mm -hmm. and that that I'm so proud of, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that they gave me that opportunity. 
So yes, yeah, sometimes people see things that you can't see in yourself, mm -hmm. but, and, but you can feel it that they're speaking truth to you. And mm -hmm. sometimes you have to listen and then it opened up a whole new world. And once you broaden your horizons, I promise you, it's so hard to, mm -hmm. to shrink them. Mm -hmm. I, I'll end with this story. I, and I say this story in, when I do the inspiration talk scenes. Mm -hmm. It's this young boy. Every day he loves to ride his, ride, ride his bike out on the side rock. Mom, can I go ride my bike? You finish your homework? Yes. They go out and ride his bike. Woo -woo. And right, there's a certain part in the, in the um, sidewalk where over time, that's in, the, 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 the concrete is cracked. It's like a little ramp. He goes there and that's his favorite part. Pop, just pop over the ramp. Woo! Every day. Can I ride my bike? One day his aunt comes over and said, hey, I'm going to take him up to Forest Park. I can say the, say the story here because usually people don't know what I'm talking about when I say Forest right, Park. Right. <laughs> you know, I'm taking you to Forest Park to ride your bike. I don't want to ride my bike in Forest Park. I want to ride my bike outside. I, mean, it's, I said, just come. So the boy goes grudging. Okay, goes on the forest park. Oh my goodness, he's riding. He has these hills, want all these little beautiful bridges. You see golf course, and then you see the zoo riding next to the zoo. You see all of these things. He's like blown away mm -hmm. by all of this. It's like, thank you, Auntie. Oh, that was amazing. So the next day, Mom, can I go ride my bike? You finish your work? Yes. He went out to ride his bike, and he rode it, and he was going down, and the feeling had changed. Like, man, what? He was going up and down the street. He said, maybe I didn't hit my ramp. But he had already hit the ramp. Mm -hmm. And I said, what? And he, he couldn't understand what happened. So I asked him, I said, what happened to the, what happened to the boy? And what had happened is that he expanded his horizons. Mm -hmm. and it's, not, it's hard to go back to something once you expand them. So Absolutely. allow yourself to expand. And you'll see that some things that you think is the greatest right now will be, become so minute you won't even notice when you pass through. That's beautiful. That's so true. Thank you so much. This has been such a rich conversation and I'm so glad you had the time and offered yourself to be able to sit down and have this. Thank you for motivational speaking right here. And I promise yeah. there'll be more opportunities if you are willing. So I'll, I'll be in contact about all that. Listen, it's a whole new area. People have, it's, I've been asked about that before. It's mm -hmm. just that I, I'm not that side. I don't, I'm the doer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, so if I find a producer, of course. Yeah. I'll do it. You know, because I, I just love to give. Mm -hmm. That's one thing I do. I love to give. Mm -hmm. that, that, now that I can do all day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and that's so true. And you've already done so much for me. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Really from the bottom of, of my heart. I appreciate I that. Um, and yeah, um, thank you again. I will make sure to pop up all your socials so, so that we know the spelling and everything. Um, and then I will make sure for all my listeners that he starts a YouTube channel. So don't worry, I'm working yeah. on it. <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll maybe put it in the description box. I don't know. We'll see how fast we can make that happen. Um, but again, this is Jermaine Smith. Please follow him on all of his social media. He is phenomenal, not just a phenomenal musician, but also a phenomenal person. And you will grab so much motivation from following him. So go check him out. And I will be in contact with you soon. Thank you.